people are investing in part because they now have an opportunity to invest in trends that they're living through. So there's a discussion about climate change, there's a discussion about space travel and so on. You're now able to go and place trades on any of these trends. If you're excited about eventual colony on Mars and you think that is a real thing that will happen in our lifetime, well, there are stocks that you can bet on that presumably will do very well when that happens. You're listening to IBKR Podcasts. Find more conversations at ibkrpodcasts.com. Please remember any trading discussions are for information purposes only and are not intended to portray recommendations. Please listen to further disclosures at the end of today's episode. Now, welcome to our show. Hi, everyone. Welcome to IBKR Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Praisman, Interactive Broker, Senior Trading Education Specialist. It's my pleasure to welcome back Jan Salaji, CEO of Tago AI. Jan has spent most of his career managing global macro strategies and holds degrees in both mathematics and economics from Yale and completed his PhD in quantitative finance at Harvard. Hi, Jan. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you very much. Really a pleasure to be back on the show. And I'm really excited for this conversation that we're going to have today. Um, really, you know, it's such a, a timely topic over the last, let's say, 15 years or so, just the rise of the active retail investor. And you know, I'm really curious if, if you could just kind of give us some background, sort of when you think this sort of started and sort of the evolution of the investor. I mean, obviously for a long time, people have been investing in pensions and 401ks, but this is, I think, a relatively recent phenomenon in, in a, you know, over the ages of investing. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that we've obviously witnessed an absolute explosion in interest in markets, particularly from some of the younger investors. But I would say that the seeds of this were actually planted early on. And I would even put it as far back as when we started seeing some of the uh, some of the, 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 the brokers begin with their online offerings. So for example, you remember that during the dot-com bubble, um, one of the things that came out of that was, for example, E-Trade, which I think back then, everybody considered to be just part of the dot-com mania, how everything needed to be on the internet. But actually, in hindsight, ultimately, everybody moved towards the model that interactive brokers also had pioneered, where people are being able to execute their trades themselves without having to call anybody and so on. So that I think was the first time that a significant barrier was really removed because it allowed people to log in at any time, execute trades at their own pace, select things that they wanted to trade and so on. Now, it then took quite a long time before we got some of the other barriers that I think were also meaningful removed that in particular were meaningful for people who had wanted to invest but didn't have the amounts of money that they were expected to put into an account like this. And so I would say among those are things like fractional share trading. I think there are things like zero commissions, which we're seeing now. And then, as you mentioned, in the conversation we were having earlier, the fact that we then went through a pandemic that forced everybody to stay at home for a long period of time further increased the time available for other things. and. Some people decided that the best thing to do was to spend it by trying to turn themselves into a better investor. So without belaboring the point, I think there are a range of factors, but I think that it's been a process that has gone on for quite a long time and went from being very gradual to suddenly really accelerating. Well, you know, it's interesting, too, that you point out the dot-com bubble because, you know, there's a whole generation of investors or maybe a couple generations at this point that have no idea that, you know, not too distant ago, you had a call, pick up your phone and call your broker to make a trade. And and that's all but unheard of at this point in time. In, in fact, I would you know make a case that probably anyone 35, 40 years or younger would have no idea that this wasn't the norm as far as just being able to log into a computer, use a trading platform, you know, log into your cell phone, use a trading platform, you know, send your trade generally no minimums almost, I would say, as far as like you that you mentioned to invest um, with the fractional shares and and just, you know, lower price stocks. And, you know, that barrier to entry is completely gone almost, it seems. Yes, that's right. I think so. That's a that's another excellent point, which is when it comes to availability of platforms where you're able to invest 
you don't even have to be in front of your laptop anymore. You can execute a trade on your commute. You're going to work. You start reading about, you know, what the Fed had done the previous day. You see the market react. You think this is the opportunity to snap up a, a trade that you've been waiting for for a long time and it takes 10 seconds and you're done. So absolutely, I think it's become very, very widespread, which of course leads to both good and bad outcomes. But nonetheless, it does mean that participation and ability to participate in public markets is at its certainly at the highest it's ever been. What do you think, um, you know, obviously with the barriers of entry being so low, and we, we've touched on like the dot-com bubble, but, you know, also 2008, where, which is probably more in recent memory of probably today's active investors, judging by their, you know, demographic qualifications. You know, would you think that had any effect on them as as far as them getting more involved, less involved, you know, also sort of the impact of social media as well, right? Like that's such, again, something that we take for granted now, but not so long ago, it really didn't exist. Yeah, you're right. I think I think uh, when we look at and talk to our users about, you know, we have, we've, we've had over 100,000 users sign up for Toggle AI and many, most of them fall into the category we talk about now. We learned quite a lot of interesting things about where they come up with trading ideas. And so many of them will now talk about things like YouTube or Reddit or any of these sources where they go for so-called stock research. Whether or not these are actually the right sources to go to, we can leave for, for a later time to discuss. But nonetheless, it does show that there's been a very, very wide range of forums that people are now turning to to find these ideas. Now, I would say during 2008 and 2009, that was present, but I think not to the same extent that it was this time. And I think what really amplified the importance of social media this time around was certainly the experience of the pandemic, because it prevented um, a lot of things that normally would have happened, people going out to lunch together, people going out to uh, talk together and so on. A lot of that interpersonal interaction was severely curtailed. And so as you were browsing the internet, you probably came across a video about somebody talking to you about options. Maybe you came across a video that talked about why investing in tech stocks or EV stocks was a really good idea. And what was the experience that most people had in the aftermath? Unbelievable rally in the stocks right after you had an amazing decline. I think the 2008, 2009 was a much more painful experience that for many of the current younger investors is nearly as relevant as what happened in March of 2020 when literally any stock that you bought a year later was worth, not even a year later, months later, was worth a lot more. And so what I'm very curious to see is as we now go through what feels like a proper bear market with Fed tightening and so on, something that many of them would have never seen before, how these investors will be able to fare through that and how they survive and what their enthusiasm and engagement with the market will do in the aftermath. Right. It's, it's very easy to love um, investing in stocks when all you see is them go up, and especially... Yeah, in a bull market, everybody's a genius, as my old boss used to say. And, you know, you made a really interesting point as far as where these, uh, you know, active retail investors are going for some of their sources, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Reddit. And, you know, the, and you, you kind of uh, maybe misstating a little bit, but you basically said like, you know, whether these are good sources or not, that leaves to be decided, right? So these aren't necessarily these investors that saw their, their, their buys go up over that course of nine months don't necessarily have the full picture of an actual market. They've never seen a bear market. Like you said, they may not be super sophisticated as far as knowing that maybe they need to start hedging their positions, you know, maybe getting into options or buying puts, they, you know, do you think they're fairly, these active investors are fairly one-sided in that they really just dwell on stocks and ETFs, say? It's a good question. And I think I would say that on the whole, the average investor is still definitely unprepared for what it takes to invest in the market in a way that would either secure some kind of income 
or sustainable capital appreciation because there is plenty of evidence that shows that actually active trading is difficult even for professional investors who do it all day long and it must be even more challenging for individual investors who don't have nearly the same kind of resources and especially now that you know we're mostly back to the office are not able to do this full time anymore this is an endeavor that they probably devote an hour of their time at the end of the day if it were that easy to make money by actively stock picking then hedge funds probably on the whole would be doing a whole lot better than they are so i would say we need to separate the idea of investing as being something that generates income versus something that to an extent is an activity that is helping people learn about markets which hopefully leads to them making better decisions about some longer term allocations but there's also presumably the entertainment value i think people are investing in part because they now have an opportunity to invest in trends that they're living through so there's a discussion about climate change there's a discussion about space travel and so on you're now able to go and place trades on any of these trends if you're excited about eventual colony on mars and you think that is a real thing that will happen in our lifetime well there are stocks that you can bet on that presumably will do very well when that happens again a lot of ifs here but um the reality is that i think there's more to this than just trying to eke out the daily p l right so so there's really not a one size fits all active retail investor it's almost like some of them may evolve into educated well thought out investors some do it for like you said it entertainment value or they believe in something, whether it's like you said, Colony of Mars, or maybe they love Starbucks and they want to just go and invest in Starbucks. And then there's others that maybe just come on the scene and are maybe looking to try to make that quick dollar thinking it's going to be, you know, it's guaranteed money, which obviously we all know that it's not. Yes, that's right. So I think that's a really good way of putting it. There's definitely a broad range of investors. I think some of them will probably over time naturally reduce the amount of money that they're able to invest that way because they will have lost some of it and presumably will say like okay you know what i need to restrict this and then there will be others who will find that actually this is a pretty good way to supplement um, some of the allocations that they're making potentially to etfs some of the allocations they're making to much more um, passive investments and so on but i think it is actually also a valuable learning experience about the variety of instruments that exist out there. Um, again, for some people, that experience will be more painful than others. Um, but overall, so long as so long as they have the resources to help them avoid making some some really large mistakes, um, then I think I think presumably the downside is relatively limited. Again, that's a, a gray area because depending on the platform, um, some of the instruments that people probably shouldn't be trading if they don't understand them in more detail are more easily accessible than in other platforms. And, you know, certainly, you know, trading education is a big part of interactive brokers. It's uh, we clearly labeled on our website. I know other brokers are following suit as well and in investing money in education. In fact, over the you know course of recent years, um, especially from, let's say, 2000. 19 2020 when you know maybe that's one really big benefit of this active retail investor too is really brought forth everyone's need to realize that education is a very important part of this you know when when the market turns around and people start losing money it's sort of like everyone realizes like wait a second we need to make sure these people know what they're doing they're educated they're not just going in blindly yeah so it's this has been fascinating to also see come through the the surveys that we do and the the dialogue that we have with our users which is there is an enormous appetite to learn of course people come to find a tool like toggle because they generally are looking for help with investing but more importantly they really value anything that they feel like they've taken away as a learning experience. So if you come in and, the, for example, in the case of Toggle, you see there are certain highlights about a particular asset, but then there's also a clear explanation as to what the P ratio is and why is the P ratio relevant for this stock, or if there is a 
a, a large range of possible outcomes for a particular stock to understand what convexity means and why you would sometimes consider options versus stocks. All of these things should not be taken for granted because to your point from earlier that there's a wide range of investors, almost every investor generally considers themselves as being still in a learning phase and wanting to get better, even some of the most experienced ones that we see, and those are typically the, the, the IB users, are always looking to improve, are always looking to make their process more rigorous, but also learn about new instruments, learn about new strategies to use those instruments and so on. So this is probably an area that we should see go through quite a lot of evolution over the next couple of years because I do think it's actually lagging. For, for the most part, the learning resources that exist across the platforms that we have found tend to be of kind of a static nature. So they will be in the form of uh, FAQs, like, oh, you know, what is an option? What is, what is convexity? What, is, what are the Greeks? And so on. This is partly why I think people search for this on YouTube, because at least then you might get a video of somebody explaining, walking you through things and so on. But um, I think there's a lot of work that can be done there to really improve the overall experience for the users. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think a, you know, a big part of that, too, can be uh, you know, paper accounts where they're trading in the virtual world. It's not real trades and they can see the cause and effect of their actions prior to doing it. You know, that's another, I think, an important user tool that a lot of exchanges provide. I know IB provides it um, and they're able to use it. You know, with with the the low barriers of entry, obviously, we've talked about all the the dangers, right? Or a lot of the dangers where they can kind of be their, the retail investor can be their own worst enemy. But there's also a lot of positives too, you know, as we've discussed. And I don't want to not, I don't want to dwell on the negatives. As, and, uh, you know, while you, again, you think about it, Trades probably used to cost twenty five, thirty dollars, then down to seven ninety five, and now basically free or, you know, a dollar depending where you go. Um, you know, stocks are now listed. IBKR has twenty stock exchanges that they have access to in the U.S. alone. So that's you know brought down the bid ask spread. So there's also a lot of, I think, really good positive things that have come out over the last you know ten, fifteen years that has probably helped spawn this active retail investor and made things easier, safer, more transparent for them as well. No doubt. I think, again, for, for the journey, I think for an investor now can be a lot more rewarding than it was before, because previously, when you try to put a trade or try to manage your portfolio actively, as we discussed, it usually involved calling somebody then, you know, over the phone deciding, do you want to trade at this level? Do you not want to trade at this level? Potentially um, getting some unsolicited advice from the, from the person on the phone. Now you are effectively having to really think through the decisions that you're making, doing them on your own. And I think, again, for those who take this seriously, it's led to really think think hard about the connection between business fundamentals and the stock price, the macro context in which all of this is taking place, the idea of risk reward. This is, I think, also somewhere where we have found that people generally can get better really quickly if you give them the right tools, which is managing the portfolio. So not just placing a trade, but then maintaining and managing that portfolio of trades, which for a professional money manager is probably at the heart of what they do. But I think for a retail investor, it's really not how they were thinking about this. They were thinking about this as a bunch of individual trades and you know, you kind of kept them until you possibly lost money in them or you made quite a lot and you at some point took them off. So I would agree with you. I think that there are definitely many, many more positives. It's There are risks as with anything else and how we manage those risks I think is going to determine to a large extent um, how successful this tick up in market participation is going to be, right? What form of investing will individuals be doing 10 years from now? Um, I think will be partly informed by their experience through both the pandemic and after and, and, and the outcomes that they, that they, that they saw from it. Well, that's a good point. And, you know, 
Where do you see the future of retail investing? You know, obviously, again, to take a step back, like the meme stocks, GameStop, AMC, et cetera, it, it does seem like they've matured away from that at least, right? You, you, those aren't necessarily in the news anymore. It, it seemed like they sort of had their moment in the sun and a lot of people got involved for various reasons, you know, whether they're trying to make some quick money. Then it seemed it also almost turned social. Like some people were upset at professional investors and were trying to, you know, run a short squeeze on them and drive GameStop up and really try to hurt professional investors that they felt had a you know edge over them. But where do you see like where do you see the future of this maybe a couple of years down the road, five years down the road, you know, ten years down the road. Obviously as technology gets better, as AI gets better, as you know, platforms get even better and more access, you know. So I would say first on your point um, regarding uh, regarding the meme stocks, I I, I I wouldn't write them off yet entirely that this phenomenon is over because I think this was this was really the first time that I think groups of individual investors were able discovered that they could actually really impact price action in a way that previously um, was really the kind of the domain of professional investors. So you know when you read some of these history books about the stock market, you read about the various pools that were formed by these, you know, robber barons and so on. They try to corner the market and so on. I think the fact that now individual investors were able in such a powerful way impact and influence the direction of a, of, of, of a stock price, that will remain quite appealing. And I don't think it's the last time that we have seen something like this. It might not be GME, we might see it somewhere else, um, but that degree of power is hard to, unless you somehow are able to regulate it away, which I think would be very difficult, um, it's a phenomenon that we'll see again. Now, separate from this, I think there are tools, and obviously Toggle is, is intended to be such a tool, that are hopefully going to help people avoid some of the stickiest situations um, by really, to a large extent, supplementing a person's ability to kind of process the information and then understanding how the information that they've taken in translates into some of the investment decisions they would make. And I think here, the analogy that we often draw when we think about the, the retail investing audience is to the evolution of self-driving. So, you know, despite Tesla's claims, I don't think that we're quite yet in the world of completely autonomous driving, but that has been the aim. However, in the process of reaching that goal, cars have gotten really quite a lot better at making everybody a safer driver. It doesn't mean that they've turned everybody into a Formula One racer, but that they have been able to help everybody with things that maybe often presented the biggest challenge. Parallel parking, for example, you have cars that will now just do that themselves. Alerting to a car in your blind spot. Again, something that could be a source of a lot of danger, but now the car will pretty much tell you that somebody's coming, don't switch the lane now, to more trivial ones, like just telling how much gas you have left in the tank. The technology I think now exists, certainly in Toggle, to let you know that you may have holdings in your portfolio that could be very susceptible to downside during a turn in the business cycle. So, for example, now there's a lot of anxiety about a recession. It would be quite helpful to a lot of active traders, I think, if they received alerts that would tell them there are three or four stocks that you currently have that generally struggled in a recession. Why don't you take a look and see whether or not this is something you still want to hold and you think, I have this for the next 10 years, I don't care, care about a recession in the next six months. So these kinds of nudges, I think are ways in which we'll be able to make the investing experience safer for the average user. Because let's face it, I think people are always going to be drawn to the markets if for no other reason that they can see other people from time to time making a big return on an investment. And so they will keep trying. Um, generally, you cannot dissuade somebody on the basis of saying, oh, look, you know, on average, the experience has been has been maybe subpar. I think people will be always looking for that boundary, test themselves and see whether or not they couldn't do better. 
So it's a really good comparison just between the you know evolution of car technology and, and trading in general. Like obviously the lower model, you know, Honda Civic has more technology in it today than say a Mercedes from 15, yes. 20 years ago. Yes. And you know, that's a really good comparison. Obviously, again, the technology gets better and cheaper as time goes on and it becomes more and more useful for the and more available. More importantly, more available to the active, you know, retail investor to be able to use. Whereas before, you know, maybe only a, a huge trading firm or a trading desk or a huge advisor group would be able to afford this technology. But as time goes on, it becomes more accessible through different platforms, and really, again, kind of levels the playing field and makes it a, a little bit um, provides more education for the for these investors as well. Yes. And, you know, interestingly, what we have found is that investors tend to be more willing to use new tools and new technology if they don't see them as completely disenfranchising them. So if they see this as more of a collaboration rather than a replacement. So, you know, the system might say, hey, you know what, here are some of the parameters that you should consider. But then the user feels like they also had an impact on the decision that they could maybe tweak a dial or two it makes them feel more like they have ownership of the decision that they finally make on the back of that. So this kind of evolution, I think, is very, very important for widespread adoption. I think um, while there is certainly a place for things like robo-advisors and so on, I think that by and large, the new generations of investors do want to have that feeling like they were part of the decision, that they weren't just being told, look, this is what is best for you and you should do this. I think increasingly they will want to have a say in this. And again, to the extent that you know we can make that environment ultimately safer for these, for these individuals, um, they will stay around longer. I think they'll participate in larger and larger size and in larger and larger numbers. So, so the idea really is that it would, you know, the AI would sift through the information, break it down into reasonable chunks that the investor can process and provide suggestions that they could make an educated choice on whether to sell, hold, or buy an individual instrument. That's right. Versus just saying, I'll take care of this for you. You don't log in at all and don't touch your trades. I'll deal with this. You know, so. Yes. Yeah, because if you think about your everyday experience just outside of markets, there are quite a lot of technologies and AI assistance that we already rely on to an extent, right? There's just the most obvious example of sort of the Alexas and Googles and series of the world, where if nothing else, you use them to quickly tell you in the morning, you know, what's the weather going to be like? And you get that is that is a nudge. If you if in the morning your Google tells you, there's a 25% chance of rain, well, maybe you grab an umbrella on the way back. And you appreciate that when there's a downpour literally right before you board, about to board the train and you don't have to come home soaking wet. Uh, this is great. Um, and you know, one last question, if you had three key pieces of advice for you know, a retail trader, what, what would they be? So I would say, Distilling it down to 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 three pieces, which is going to be hard because I think that every time when I think about this, <laughs> I have twenty. Um, but three very important ones is what, number one: always, always think about the downside. Control your risk, right? I think generally what professional investors have found out is that the upside takes care of itself, but the downside is where it becomes really difficult. And so proactively think about what is the downside for any single investment that you're making and what is the point at which you will exit the trade because you can no longer take the losses or because you don't think that the thesis that you had for it has been borne out. Second, um, always keep learning about new instruments and potentially new investments. What we have also found is that a lot of investors tend to invest in a very narrow set of, of, of stocks, the ones that get the most attention on social media in various discussion forums and so on. And I think that's a shame because actually you can probably introduce um, or let's say de-risk your portfolio 
by thinking a little bit beyond the meme stocks and the most obvious technology companies and so on. So if you're really out there looking to potentially make some lucrative investments, go a little bit out of your comfort zone and learn about businesses that you know might you might not have read about before. Um, study up on the on the on on the stock, the business, and so on, and try to expand your horizons. And then I would think the third one would effectively just be have patience. Don't feel like every day when you come in, you need to always trade something. Like think about what's the right entry point. And I think you will find that overall that is going to be a far more rewarding experience because if you give yourself the chance of the right moment and the right entry level, you'll find that your returns are going to improve quite substantially. So those are probably three, but again, as I said, there are at least 17 more that we could go through, but that's for another episode. No, this has been great. Um, you know, thank you so much. You know, once again, I'd like to you know, thank our guest, Jan Salaji, for joining us at IBKR Podcast. Thank you, Jeff. For more from Jan and Tago, please go to our website under education to view previous webinars and podcasts, as well as keeping an eye out for any upcoming live events. I also remind everyone that you can find all our podcasts on our website under education. Scroll down to IBKR Podcasts or on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, Podbeam, Google Podcasts, and Audible. Thank you for listening. Until next time, I'm Jeff Praisman with Interactive Brokers. Thanks for listening to IBKR Podcasts. As always, we have more episodes at ibkrpodcasts.com. And if you're interested in learning more about interactive brokers, visit ibkr.com. We offer more trading education material, such as webinars at ibkrwebinars.com, financial and economic commentary at tradersinsight.news, market-related courses at tradersacademy.online, and quant-related articles at ibkrquant.com. Options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. For more information, read the characteristics and risks of standardized options, or ODD, which may be accessed through the link found in the show's notes or podcast description page. The interviewee's employer or associated organization has a business relationship as a client with interactive brokers. The analysis in this material is provided for information only and is not and should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security. To the extent that this material discusses general market activity, industry or sector trends, or other broad-based economic or political conditions, it should not be construed as research or investment advice. To the extent that it includes references to specific securities, commodities, currencies, or other instruments, those references do not constitute a recommendation by IBKR to buy, sell, or hold such investments. The material does not and is not intended to take into account the particular financial conditions, investment objectives, or requirements of individual customers. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and is necessary. Seek professional advice.